What do you think the difference between this and this are? Well, you'd probably say, Clyde, that's the same thing. I don't see any difference. Uh, but under the eyes of the government, apparently if you're a foreigner and they hire you, you can use either one of those. Rod Giltaka, thank you so much for joining me, of course, representing the CCFR and our rights here in Canada, people who are firearms owners and just people who want to become firearms owners. You're standing up for our rights every day. Now, I want to talk about this particular story that happened recently. Can you give me a rundown? I, I understand that there's these prohibited weapons. They're prohibited now. Uh, the firearms known as AR-15s. And but we just recently had a case where a bunch of deer needed to be culled on an island. Can you explain this? So the the island is Sydney Island, and it's off the coast of Vancouver Island. Uh, I've been I was corrected on that because I thought it was on Vancouver Island. But uh, when you when you get something wrong on the internet, Clyde, you may be aware of this. Uh, you'll get inundated with messages that you were wrong on a on a small detail. Even after story. you correct it, I, I'm, I'm aware of this. Yes, yeah. yes, a little still but, let you um, know you were wrong. But yeah, apparently this this uh, deer infestation, it's a it's a small deer. I'm not a hunter, right, myself, um, but it's called a fallow deer. And they're small, and I guess they're an invasive species. They they basically ravage any vegetation on, on the island. And it's been a problem that's been going on for, I think, 20 years or something, or more than 20 years. But I guess the government, uh, as part of their eradication program, has decided that uh, they would cull these deer using helicopters and bring in uh, foreign contractors to shoot using AR-15 platform rifles, because I'm not sure whether they were AR-15s or AR-10s. The difference is the AR-10 shoots a, a larger cartridge, a larger bullet than the AR-15, but it's the same, same function. Uh, they would also use 30 round mags uh, and they would also use suppressors. So all of those things are prohibited in Canada. In fact, the government has has, uh, has said that they are too, they have no use and no purpose uh, to be in Canada whatsoever. Um, and they've uh, prohibited these firearms uh, for re regular everyday people. But I guess if you're a, a contractor, not only can you use these firearms for hunting, um, but you can also use suppressors, which are prohibited and full capacity magazines and do it from a helicopter. So it's, it's quite, a, quite a curious thing. Well, yeah, because I keep hearing the 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 argument that these are they're weapons of war. They're not tools for hunting. Uh, you wouldn't need that many uh, rounds at any given time in order to. I mean, we're we're really proving the point here that those are all inaccurate statements, uh, right from why they've hired these people to do this and why they hired from outside the country. Obviously, they're prohibited now in Canada. So we, even if you were a contractor in Canada, you wouldn't be able to uh, have the tools necessary in order to pull this off in Canada. Now, again, is there, I'm guessing there's restrictions from firing uh, any sort of firearm from a helicopter as well. But this is, uh, like, how did this happen? How, do, how does it, how do we go from, um, writing these regulations to completely uh, stepping against all the things that are, are said in the regulation and hiring people and allowing them even to uh, use the these tools in our own country? Well, I don't know what the process was, but I think this had to do with Parks Canada and they made this decision. And I've had, um, since we started talking about it, we've had more information from people that are locals, you know, emailing us. And so I'm going to go on a little bit of information that was emailed to me from someone that is a resident of the of the island, Sydney Island. So what they told me was this has been going on a long time. This island is 750 acres. So this is not a it's not a big place. Um, so when you think about that, it's like, well, how come you couldn't have had hunters from British Columbia um, pay a thousand bucks for a tag and they can shoot as many of these deers and take them and harvest the meat as they wanted to? Well, how come you can't have indigenous hunters from the local area? I mean, the Haida Gwaii is just a, a stone's throw away from this island. They could have had indigenous hunters come and harvest all the meat and feed their communities. Uh, you know, they could have, instead of the government paying uh, close to a million dollars to have this done, this helicopter hunt done, um, and it, which worked out to something like, I don't know, whatever, $10,000 a deer. And apparently they shot seven or eight of the wrong species because they're shooting from a helicopter. Instead of doing that, they could have made money 
by allowing British Columbia residents and indigenous uh, people to come and do it for them. No bag limit, you know, one shot at a time, everything would have been fine. And these deer probably would have been taken care of, but I don't know. I'm, I mean, to be fair, I'm not privy to all of the, you know, all of the, uh, the conditions that exist uh, that, you know, got them to arrive at that decision, you know? And I think, I think it's important for all of us to always consider that. Like, I don't know all everything there is to know about this story, but from the, from the outside, <laughs> it just looks really bad. Right. Well, absolutely. It looks really bad. And like, I, I can understand that, you know, law enforcement would be able to have certain firearms that civilians maybe can't have. Military can have uh, certain firearms that civilians can't have. But why contractors from a foreign land for a, a domestic use? And this is this is by all means a domestic thing uh, to go in and call uh, a number of deer uh, invasive species or not. Because uh, callings happen all the time. I mean, we live in, I live in British Columbia, you live in British Columbia. It's, it's, it's something we read about quite often. And when we hear about it, this is always the, the case that I hear in the local area from hunters that are friends of mine saying, why didn't they just call us or call on us, put an ad in the paper. I would have showed up. No problem. I could bag another deer this year. No problem. That would be great. But this is, it's just absurd to me. Now getting to the actual, like, um, so I, I want to know about more about the prohibitions of these firearms. Now I had a picture up at the very beginning of the, the segment. This is an AR-15 platform. Um, what makes this more dangerous or, uh, elusive or scary or wh whatever it is that makes this uh, platform that they want to um, ban uh, take off the market as opposed to some others that, that shoot the same caliber uh, rounds. What What is it? Nothing. Well, that's a simple answer. Okay, I wasn't expecting that. All right, so <laughs> there, there's nothing. It's, it's, it's really oh. arbitrary. Is that arbitrary? Yeah, it is. It's a center fire semi-automatic rifle, just like any other one that's even legal still today. Um, but, you know, it's this gun control is about 90 percent political. And that's that's the issue. And, and, and you know, you can kind of tell when something's political because you're like, well, this doesn't make any sense. And it's like, yeah, because when you inject politics into it, of course, it's going to be it's not going to make any sense. So, you know, even if you go back to what we were just talking about, you have the government when they banned those guns on May 1st, 2020, they said that there's only one reason the, you know, the, the AR-15 is designed for one use and it's to kill the most amount of people in the shortest amount of time. It's a weapon of war used for soldiers to kill other soldiers and has no other legitimate use and is not for hunting or scaring off a bear or any of the other things they said in that press conference. It was ridiculous. It was a, you know, it was the circus of the, of the ignorant, that press conference, but you know, they, they, they tell that to you categorically out of hand, like there is no use and no place for this in this country. And then they turn around and they use it for exactly for that reason. And they, again, couple it with suppressors, like suppressors are sort of another topic. I don't want to veer off or anything, but suppressors are legal. Like in the UK, they're legal in, you know, I think 30 other countries. In fact, I think in the UK, in some in uh, in some instances, you are required to use suppressors at certain gun ranges so that you don't disturb the neighbors. They're not for assassins, right? But in Canada, it's so political and and so hyperbolic and hysterical. It's just like, well, a suppressor. Oh my God, you know, it's, if I owned a suppressor, I'd be shooting people. So you can't own them. They are prohibited. And then the government turns around and says. Well, we want to hunt these deer. We don't want to disturb anybody. We're going to let foreigners come in and use suppressors. It just, and I, I do want to add one more thing, Clyde. The idea that they're using AR-15 platforms and suppressors and full capacity magazines, standard capacity, to hunt these deer, which are small animals, like there, there's nothing unreasonable about that. That's not unreasonable at all. That's not an unreasonable use for the AR-15. In countries where it's legal to, sh to hunt with AR-15s, they're widely used, like the United States. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just the, the, what makes this story so ridiculous is they're saying that, you know, in, in no universe would you ever do that, and they turn around and they do it themselves. So that's the part. So from my understanding, for, for, for speaking to the suppressors, I'm a mechanic, and for me, suppressors, it, it, banning those is, 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 is likening it to banning mufflers on your car. I mean, it, that really is the function of a suppressor. It, it muffles the sound. It's not, it's not silent. It's just a lot less loud. 
uh, and, and damaging to people's ears. But I wanted to ask you, um, now that they've made this a prohibited firearm, not it's not uh, it's not restricted anymore. You can't own them, they say. How does this work for all of the thousands and thousands of Canadians that own these things? Well, that's kind of fun in, in itself. So on May 1st, 2020, which is, you know, over three years ago, um, the Liberal government, aided and abetted, of course, by the NDP and the Bloc Québécois, they, they uh, came out with an order in council, said that they were banning all of these guns, and people like me own those guns, right? And people that with range memberships and, and all the rest of that stuff. And uh, they said, well, we're going to ban these things. And but hey, you know, we're, this isn't aimed at licensed gun owners. Uh, so we're going to buy these guns back. We're going to pay you for them. So, of course, there's a lot of moving parts there, right? Like, are you going to pay me what they're worth? Or are you going to just pay me some nominal fee to just stop me from getting super angry about it? Or what are you going to do? Well, of course, in a country as large as Canada, 10, 10 million square kilometers, um, doing a gun buyback is near impossible. I mean, it's a huge undertaking, but they didn't, they saw a political opportunity. So they were like, ah, who cares? We'll, we'll worry about that later. So they banned them. And three and a half years later, there's no gun buyback. It's not even, they're not even, they don't even have a framework put together for a gun back three and a half buyback, three and a half years later. So what we're allowed to do with these guns is we have to just keep them can't use them, can't take them to the range. AR-15s were restricted before you could only shoot them in an approved shooting range. It's not even like you could have hunted with them or took them out to the bush, but they're like, that's too dangerous. That is putting public safety at risk, Rod, you know, gun lobby guy with your AR-15 going to the range and going straight home, right? So they've been sitting locked up in gun safes around Canada and we just can't use them. We still have them. If I was going to go crazy, I still have it. And you can't even sell can't it. You can't, the range. you can't even transfer it to anyone else. Yeah. And you can't, yeah, I can't buy more. I can't sell it to anybody. I can't pass it down to my kids. Not, you know, I just have to sit here with it, you know, and in my case, probably $10,000 worth of hardware and, you know, but I guess Canada is a safer place. So that's where we are today. Uh, how many criminals have lined up to give their AR-15s back since this legislation? I, I don't think that they uh, have uh, one reported uh, surrendering of an AR-15 from a criminal yet. <laughs> but, uh, it's just, that's only been three and a half years, you know? Who knows, man? It could be one. Well, on that note, thank you so much for coming to uh, talk to us today, Rod. And keep up the good work. Thank you so much for everything you do. I appreciate it, Clyde.